Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, where, depending on where you are. My name is Catherine Jamy. I'm a researcher with the French CNRS, and I am the chair of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. Uh, this committee was founded in 2020 uh, by uh, essentially um, ISC member scientific unions, which had taken part in a three-year project called the, uh, the Gender Gap in Science, how to measure it, how to um, reduce it. So um, uh, this committee is now interested in uh, ensuring liaison between uh, scientific unions so that we work together more effectively across disciplines to promote gender equality in science. One of our activities is to organize a webinar and today is our seventh uh, webinar session. Most webinars so far have been organized by one or two unions, but uh, to celebrate the uh, International Day of Women and Girls in Science, which the actual date was three days ago on the 11th of February, uh, SCGES has decided to join the uh, Global Women Breakfast so those of us who are present here had a nice breakfast together before we start work. And uh, now we will uh, hold this seminar in hybrid form. Um, and uh, today, the uh, seminar is devoted to presenting uh, the most recent results of um, the Gender Gap in Science project because with the da data collected, um, research is going on. And we will also uh, hear about some alternative approaches to the gender gap, because of course we do need to take into account every um, possibility that research yield in order to work on reducing the gender gap. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Professor um, Mei Hong Jo, who is a professor at the uh, uh, National Taiwan Normal University. Uh, who uh, was one of the two uh, coordinators of the Gendering uh, Gap in Science project, and she will chair this session. Mei Hong, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Usual. I need to give you a little more information on the, who the audience is. Of course, the slides are acting up. So uh, we'll get back to the beginning. Please bear with me. Um, there, right. So uh, the people who had registered to this webinar as of yesterday, uh, there were 152 of them. And as you can see, most the, 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 the larger group is in Europe, a little more than a third, but all continents are represented uh, despite um, time difference. Uh, the gender breakdown is, uh, well, a little more than three quarters declared to be women, about 10% have stated they are male, and also the rest prefers not to answer. As for disciplines, uh, we have a large representation of mathematics and next or psychology, but we actually have um, uh, a lot of uh, different disciplines, which is exactly what we aim because we want that uh, the, the good practices that some scientific disciplines have adopted should be known as widely as possible across disciplines. Um, and as for uh, participants uh, age or the state, stage of their career, uh, we have basically uh, every stage of uh, career is interested in uh, gender equality, which uh, is very good news. And now I will really call for Mei Hong with apologies. Welcome. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Um, happy uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> it's lovely to uh, share everything with you on this special day. So, um, uh, okay. Um, first of all, before I start my introduction of the uh, GWB, I would like to uh, show my uh, uh, great uh, attitude to International Science Council who sponsored this event, and also the uh, scientific unions. Um, 
they also support some uh, uh, representatives uh, from uh, different parts of the world and also to make this event possible. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you a very brief background about the uh, uh, Global Women's uh, Breakfast. And uh, I'm on the uh, executive uh, committee of uh, International Union of uh, Pure and Applied Chemistry and also on the uh, uh, SCGS. And uh, uh, I'm also on the uh, uh, governing board of the International Science Council. It is my honor uh, to uh, uh, chair this session. So uh, the event was uh, uh, initiated back to 2011 when the, uh, uh, Okay, thanks. Uh, when the uh, uh, Marie Curie received her um, her uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry for the 100th anniversary. And by then, uh, Mary Garson, uh, one of the uh, uh, board member of IUPAC, uh, initiated this event. And then uh, the event was uh, reinitiated again in the year of uh, 2019. And that was uh, claimed, uh, proclaimed by the United Nations as the International Year of the Periodical Table. <laughs> so uh, Laura McConnell and Mary Garson uh, started this uh, uh, event since 2019 and it became an annual event. So if um, your unions or your society uh, in science uh, would like to join our event, uh, please contact us and we will have this normally in February. So, um, and what the purposes of uh, having the uh, GWB? Um, basically we have a theme for each year and this year is to break the uh, uh, barriers in science. So, and also we tried, uh, this year is the international year of uh, basic sciences for uh, sustainable development. So starting from this year, we are welcome and embrace uh, all the uh, scientists from different inter, uh, the disciplines to join this event. And why do we want to do that? We want to have the uh, scientists uh, to develop their professional expertise and also making the uh, network among youngest and the uh, senior uh, scientists. So we could, as the uh, senior scientists, they could help the uh, younger uh, uh, chemists or scientists to get to uh, know more about their field and get some support. And also uh, uh, we try to use this as a platform to introduce a lot of uh, uh, scientific uh, achievements. So I think there are a lot of uh, possibilities to have this as a vehicle to bring the people together. And then uh, since uh, the uh, 2011, we have uh, only 100 events and 5,000 uh, participants. And by now we already have uh, 363 or 407 uh, last year uh, events across the globe and more than uh, 18,000 people participated. So um, as you can see, I'm going to show you uh, what do we have this year. And this year, as you can see the, uh, the heart, um, when people decided to host the event, you will have the, uh, the heart, empty heart on the map. Okay, and once you complete your event, the heart will full of the blood. <laughs> and so you can see uh, it started from the New Zealand and then to Australia when the sun goes up. And then like in Taiwan, the uh, event has uh, been finished and they already celebrated the event. And now we just started. So we just, you know, pass one from the other. So when you hold this event, you could contact the previous one and say, okay, at what time we could have the link with other countries. So I think we really want to use this as a platform to have other people build up their network and support each other. And um, as you can see in India this year, they have 49 events in India and United States, there will be 32. And Nigeria has been very supportive. Um, they keep doing this for years. And they have, uh, you know, 30. So I'm not going to go all the way down, but in Mexico, 24, Italy, you know, 19, and keep going down to the uh, the list. So here are the uh, uh, top 10 uh, events uh, from different countries. Oops, 
uh, it should be 2019. And uh, you can see uh, India, Nigeria, Mexico, you know, these countries are very supportive. Of course, Western uh, Europe or uh, Africa, you know, all the corners of the, uh, the world. So we really want to uh, support the uh, chemists, particularly the female chemists, uh, female uh, scientists to work together and to let them uh, um, educate or cultivate more young uh, uh, students to be in STEM. So uh, that's a very brief introduction and you are more than welcome uh, to ask me why uh, we are, I'm here and I would like to promote more information if I could be uh, helpful. So let's go to the uh, first talk by Mary Francoise Roy, and she is the uh, Emerita Professor of Mathemati Mathematics in Rennes, uh, and she is also the Chair of uh, International uh, Mathematics Union Committee for Women in Mathematics uh, for the past uh, eight years, and also she was the uh, co-leader of the Gender Gap in Science. So please join me uh, to welcome uh, Mary Francoise to the stage. Thank you. Okay. So thanks, uh, Nihon. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so what I wanted to tell you today is about the Gender Gap in Science project and some of its outcomes. Okay, so I think maybe many of you know already about the Gender Gap in Science project, but let me remind you something about it. So it was officially uh, funded by the International Science Council from 2017 to 2019. And the co-leaders were uh, Mei Hong and myself. And uh, there is still a lot of information about the project uh, on our website. And uh, it was a multi multidisciplinary and multicultural project with uh, 11 organizations participating, including UNESCO, Gender Insights, um, uh, ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, and otherwise it was uh, uh, really uh, unions uh, belonging to the International Science Council, so that uh, the International Mathematical Union, the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry, then for Physics, for Astronomy, uh, the Applied Mathematics Union, and so on and so on. And uh, as a result of our project, we had written a book uh, which was published. Uh, online in 2020, which is called the Global Approach to the Gender Gap in Mathematical Compute Computing and Natural Sciences, how to measure it, how to receive it, to reduce it. And uh, you can find it online on uh, Zenodo. Of course, of everything is going to be recorded, so you don't need to, to write the, the URLs, I think. In any case, the, this book was uh, quite successful. We had more than uh, 9,500 loads. And uh, if you don't like to have it as a, as just a PDF file, you can also, there is a print on demand mechanism, which means that for a very low price, uh, you can get the book. Um, and uh, of course, otherwise it's freely available on, on Zenodo. So I don't want to give too many details about it, but there are many people uh, who contributed. And uh, we also like to have some cartoons by, uh, by Lea Castor. Okay, so there were three parts in this project. So the first part was the global survey of scientists. So uh, we know that it started with the global survey of physics, of physicists, which was done before, but then uh, it becomes something uh, totally pluridisciplinary. Then there is the second part, which was the analysis of academic publications, where there were millions of publications which were analyzed since 1970. <laughs> with respect to the, uh, say, uh, gender distribution of the authors and, and things like that. And then uh, another topic was what we call the database of good practices, where 68 activities from all over the world and from uh, uh, various uh, also disciplines and approaches were analyzed and put on a, 
on a database. And then at the end of the project, uh, we thought it was also important to issue some recommendations. So for instructors and parents, for local organizations and for scientific units. Okay, so now I'll say a little bit about uh, each of these three topics. So for the global survey of scientists, uh, we had some uh, research questions and uh, the institution which took, play, which, uh, took care of this aspect was the American Institute of Physics because we had this uh, funding coming from the International Science Council and we could use it to have some professional uh, people work on, uh, on the project. So it was not a questionnaire only for women, it was really for all possible scientists. And we wanted to, to understand the scientist approach, like their development of interest in science, uh, what they, how they experience their education and careers, their work-life balance, family support, and so on. And we wanted also to be, uh, uh, to see if they had, they thought they had enough resources to conduct their uh, scientific research and also enough opportunities. And we wanted to, to do that uh, all over the disciplines, but also all over the world in various scientific zones. So finally, the, the main conclusion, so we were able to, to get uh, 32,000 answers to this questionnaire in 130 countries, and uh, the questionnaire was uh, translated in eight different languages. And basically what we got, so that the summary by, by Lea of all the difficulties for a woman to, to become a scientist. And basically we see that in all possible disciplines and all over the world, the women experiences both educational and employment settings are consistently less positive than men's. And uh, we had a specific question also about sexual harassment. I think it was not the case before in the former uh, questionnaire by physicists, but of course, because of the Me Too uh, uh, also movement uh, that will, became very important. And over a quarter of women respondents reported personally experiencing sexual harassment at school or work. Okay. And uh, that was the distribution of uh, respondents. Uh, so you see that, uh, of course, it does not correspond to the uh, real size of the scientific community. It's more uh, uh, reflex, I mean, uh, some uh, image of uh, the people we were able to, to touch. For example, I mean, the proportion of, of answers for mathematics is more than 10%, and of course, they're not. 10% of mathematicians uh, among the scientists. And inside mathematics, we had also a special subcategory, which was, uh, which was um, the uh, applied mathematics. We had many, many answers from physics. And also depending from the discipline, the percentage of women and men was not the same, but overall we had a distribution of 50% male, 50% female answers, which is of course, doesn't correspond to the scientific community because in the scientific community there are more men than women, but it means really the questionnaire was uh, broadly distributed. And uh, so we, we are interested in possible exceptions, but we didn't find any. So we thought that there is really an important gender gap in science across all disciplines, all employment sectors, all geographic regions, and all levels of development because we also considered the uh, index of development to, to, to analyze uh, different groups of, uh, of countries. Okay, so uh, then uh, we had uh, another topic, which was the analysis of uh, academic publication. And this time it was a new technology, which was not based on uh, people answering a questionnaire, but uh, rather analyzing the existing uh, data where you can uh, automatically uh, the, uh, uh, decide whether the author is, uh, is male or female. Uh, so we wanted to explore the effects of gender on publication practices on different academic fields, and also across the world countries and region. And we wanted this way to identify common or discipline specific issues that might require interventions in view of the uh, gender gaps. 
and also provide access to aggregated data and interactive visualization for the scientific community, which means also some democratization of data and possible explorations. So uh, this study of publication is particularly important because scientific publications are really something which play a key role in the career of scientific uh, uh, of scientists and their reputation, and also uh, all decisions on tenure and other academic promotions are mostly based on evaluations of the uh, research uh, portfolios uh, publication. Thus, so we thought that's uh, really something uh, important. So uh, finally, that's a typical uh, result we, we got by looking at all the publications in the database, which is called Central, Central Blood for Mathematics, which is a free database. We were able to see that from 1970 to uh, 2020, the proportion of uh, women publishing uh, among authors of mathematics, the, the proportion of women went from 10% to about 30% say 27%. And uh, similar results uh, in, uh, in physics with a big difference between uh, say astrophysics, for example, where the proportion of women was better and say theoretical physics uh, where it was lower, but with a similar trend to, to more publications. And uh, that the database that we are used, so either archive, some selected journals in chemistry and uh, in mathematics, DBMAT, as I mentioned, and then in astronomy and astrophysics, it was the ADS. So it was also interesting to study what is called the productivity gap, which means the number of papers published by female scientists compared to male. And we see that this productivity gap tends to, uh, tends to, to become um, uh, to become better all over the, the world. So you see, in, in the 70s, there were few female publishing, but then they would even publish less uh, in uh, compared to men, I mean, over time. But now when, when we grow uh, in, uh, in time and we, we reach like the last one is from uh, 2000, then we see that the, there is no, not so many differences between the number of papers published by female and, and male. That's was again mathematics. However, if we look at the top journals, uh, we see that the proportion was very low in 1970. Less than 10% of top journals papers were authored by women, both in chemistry, in mathematics, and so on, in astronomy and theoretical physics. But in 2020, even though the proportion of women came from 10% to 30%, we see that in the top journals, it's not uh, visible. So now it's 10% of top journals in astronomy, astrophysics, and chemistry, but still under 10% in mathematics and theoretical physics, even though the proportion of women has been growing. Okay. Okay, so that the, the summary of what I said. So there are really increasing proportions of women entering science. This phenomenon of having a low rate of publication uh, now uh, become more similar to, to both genders and the productivity, oh, productivity gap gets uh, narrower. But in various renowned journals, women remain underrepresented, underrepresented and especially in highly theoretical topics. So in topics which are more collaborative and, uh, and uh, and uh, see more applied, <coughs> the uh, proportions are better. And also, um, uh, we, we could also analyze the proportions in some uh, geographic zones. And, uh, and uh, there are really some uh, African, uh, for, for example, parts of the world where there are really no representation of women in astronomy or, or mathematics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now our third uh, topic that we were looking at with the database of good practices. And there the aims was to gather and make available information and resources on effective practices for enhancing the participation of girls and women in science at all levels. And also gather and generate evidence about effectiveness of the collected practices and to disseminate these selected practices worldwide 
focusing on contexts where participation of girls or women is particularly low. And uh, so uh, Marilyn Goose was in charge of this part. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can read what she's uh, saying here, but she is what a variety of initiatives to reduce the gender gap all over the world. We really need a conceptual framework to help us understand and evaluate them. And uh, so they, they use uh, some dimensions of good practices that had been pre uh, predefined by the UNESCO in their SAGA project. And finally, uh, in this database of good practices, you see every, several initiatives for engage families and communities to support uh, STEM careers for girls, engage females in exploring socio-scientific issues, promote social support, such as peer networks, mentoring, and also uh, develop some female uh, leadership, advocacy, and communication skills. Okay, and uh, this database of good practices, again, you can uh, reach on this, uh, so it's uh, supported by the uh, International Mathematical Union, where you can reach the, the database. Now we had a set of recommendations, so I'm not going to enter into details, but it was basically for instructors and parents, for scientific and educational organizations, and for scientific unions. And uh, we discussed, uh, we are still discussing a few of them inside the SCGS uh, committee. Okay. And we also made a summary of the project, which is available in eight, in several languages. It's an eight page uh, summary. So in English, French, Spanish, as well as two kinds of Chinese. Okay. Now the outcomes is what we are mostly going to discuss today. So it's continuation and new approaches. So uh, the first topic uh, will be uh, what interventions for more women in science and at the next lecture by uh, Guillaume Mollard. Then we are going to see further analysis of the data survey, of the data from the survey. So in math, applied math physics, Africa and Latin America, and there will be lectures by Sophie and Rachel. And then finally, uh, the continued research and publication pattern is going to be uh, presented by Elena. So one important aspect of the outcomes of the Gender Gap in Science project was to keep up the network. And that's uh, what we did when we created the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. So initially, the uh, Memorandum of Understanding was signed by nine founding partners. Most of them are members of the International Science Council. And then now it has been signed by 20 more part 20 partners in, as a whole, including many other unions like uh, we've seen uh, in during this meeting, uh, International Geographic uh, Union and so on and so on. And uh, we've been uh, doing two annual reports already of the standing committee. And we had also six webinars and uh, this is the seventh. Okay, so that's, I think, oh, I just wanted to, to thank you for your attention. And I think, in fact, yeah. well, of course, if there are questions, it's good, but we are also on time for, for Guillaume's yeah. lecture, so. Maybe uh, just one question. Ah, okay, so um, maybe a uh, one question for the uh, audience here. Do you have any questions? Yes, Alison. Hi, um, can I use the microphone? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so, so I'm going to repeat the question. Oh. Yeah. I'm having a look around this room, and with all due respect to the lot of wisdom in this room, from our age, and the and I'm hoping that there are younger people online. And I just want to know how can we make sure particularly unions are involving younger people in this process and journey to get their choice? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, so the question, so we had a question from uh, um, Alison. Alison, who's, uh, who's a, a member of the uh, International uh, Science Council? And uh, she's asking, um, how do we involve younger people? And of course, it's uh, 
certainly an open question for all of us. But uh, one way is to involve young people, maybe not only, we, try, we are not maybe looking only for young women, but we are looking for more young people to get involved in this uh, scientific organization. And this way, of course, it can, uh, it can uh, let's say, uh, improve the, the proportion of, uh, of women, but we, as we've seen, I mean, I don't know if you were still were arrived when uh, Catherine presented the um, uh, the information about uh, who is attending today, and we have it here, I guess. Uh -huh. Yeah. Next. Yes. So, in fact, when we see who is interested and who's participating to this webinar, we see really a, a lot of people, I mean, undergraduate students and so on and so on. So it's really very uh, widely uh, distributed among uh, who is attending. If okay. I may just add one word, this is a campus for graduate students in the social sciences and humanities. So the neighbors are not young scientists. Mm -hmm. but, but I think Alison addressed a very important issue, how to bring more young uh, scientists in. And now, now here we have uh, uh, more than 10 unions, scientific unions here, and I think they will bring the uh, message back and encourage you, uh, more young scientists to participate yeah. and to interact with mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, okay, so many thanks for this uh, important question. And it's certainly we something we we are thinking of and we are trying to to address in this uh, committee. Uh, I, I think uh, during our breakfast, so we communicated with the representatives from each union and uh, they are aware. And I believe uh, we will have more people to participate. Oh, yeah, thank you for pointing me to the uh, speakers. So on um, the people I'm like here. <laughs> okay, uh, let's thank you very much, Marie Francoise, for your presentation. So now let's go to the uh, second one. Uh, the uh, uh, Professor Gulum uh, Harlat. Yeah, uh, he is the uh, co deputy of uh, Crest uh, and the uh, vice president of the economics department of uh, Eco Poly. Technique, and uh, his uh, research interests are including the uh, following areas: uh, behavioral uh, economics, experimental e economics, and the pol public policy. And I think promoting uh, gender equality, we do need to have a lot of uh, policies uh, to be uh, established. So uh, please join me uh, for, for your uh, for the next uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, you have the flow. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for having me. Um, I would speak louder. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so um, I didn't decide it for the title. It's a very broad title, so I can't cover everything, like how to change everything, basically. But I tried to give you uh, a flavor of the recent developments we had, uh, say, in economics, but not just economics. Uh, to do, say, evaluation of public policies. And I would explain exactly what it means and how it applies, uh, perhaps, to women in science. So I think that an interesting starting point is the fact that, um, as the previous uh, talk did, uh, it's easy to uh, document a, a large gender gap in science. Uh, and I think there's a widely shared consensus uh, on something I submit, it, it's a way to explain that. Perhaps it's a leaky <laughs> pipeline, which means that uh, when you go along the hierarchical ladder, uh, you have less and less women at each stage. Okay, so I put a graph that you may see here. Uh, it's for high schools. Most of my examples are for high school, but I, I'm thinking broadly about research in science. So what you see on this graph is that bold line. You see the fraction of girls in grade 10, it's the majority of girls. Uh, grade 11, especially when it comes to science, it's going down a bit. It's going uh, it's rather flat. And then in France, you have to uh, choose a, a path an academic path. And as you can uh, see, it's going down to 30% uh, if you go to STEAM programs. So women are not doing so bad, but every time there, there is like a, a new bar 
the fraction of women is going down. Okay, and that's super easy to document that all around the world in many ways. You documented it for uh, publications in top journals and so on. So I think we broadly agree on the consensus. I mean, that's not something we need to document much more. It's there, I mean, and everybody agrees on that. Um, <clears throat> What is perhaps not so clear is once we have found that large gender gap, in basically all Western countries, more than Western countries, but there are a few exceptions, it's very well documented, but there's a sharp contrast, I would say, uh, if we look at what should we do, where do we start from there, okay, what can be done, all right, and then we don't have a consensus anymore, okay, people disagree, people have many ideas, it's not exactly that they object on some things, but there's a list of things that can be done, and we have no clear idea which one works best, which one should do we use first, and so on. So I'm not going to give the answer to that question, as you can expect, but I would try to um, provide some insights that can help looking at what works and isolate perhaps what works best from what doesn't work so well and how can we do that in a scientific way if possible okay uh, so we're going to try to investigate a little bit why there is a, such a, a contrast between what we see and what we would like to happen right um, so um, we would like to have i would call it a science of women in science we want to study these uh, problems in a scientific way we are scientists and we'd like to provide some more science on what can be done okay I would explain a little bit why it's a difficult question. Uh, every science is difficult, okay? We, claiming that uh, the world is more complex than we expected, okay, it's not good science, it's just uh, looking at the world. Uh, so, but still there are some issues and there are things that may be misunderstood. So sorry if you know all ab about all that, but I think it's uh, important to provide clear benchmarks in that respect. So I would provide examples of interventions, some who work, some who don't work. Uh, I would introduce you to the main tool of quantitative policy evaluation, and uh, I would point at some interventions, and as I said, it's not a review. I don't have the time to review everything, and I don't know everything, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so if we want to make, say, the, the science of women in science, I think we should pay attention to uh, the tools we now have that allows us to evaluate actions. We call them interventions. And there are a few things I want you to pay attention to, and I may explain why it's a difficult question. Uh, one of them is the, is, I would call it heterogeneity of treatment effects. So when we, when we want to change things, uh, the, the way people respond to these changes differs a lot across people, okay? And that's something we should take into account. There's not something that would help all women, okay? Uh, and that's something we should pay attention to, I think. Scaling is a big issue too. It's easy to identify some small initiatives that do work, okay? We all know about passionate scientists, female scientists, men also, who <laughs> share their knowledge with people who are very good at attracting people, at promoting women and so on. But can we scale that? Can we do it everywhere in all sciences, everywhere in the world? Not so sure, okay? So something that works at small scale does not necessarily work at a large scale. And that's something we want to pay attention to. And there are a few scientific aspects that would help us predict what can be generalized, okay? And one last but not least, we have to pay attention to uh, cost-benefit analysis. What do I mean by that? Uh, something that works, but is super costly, is probably less likely to be generalized than something that is super cheap, okay? So I would also provide examples and so on, okay? So it's more like walking you through examples so you can get that sort of mindset <laughs> that we get from all these evaluation tools. Uh, and <clears throat> the reason why it's difficult is exactly because paying attention to all these things at the same time is difficult. And uh, I was explain uh, our intuition is not helping much in that respect. I think if we want to address gender issues, I'm working in the field, it's a, it's a broad field, there are many scientists on that. It's, you might be very surprised by some results, okay? And so I want to provide examples. So maybe you, want to see examples more than general talks. Uh, so here is the reform that happened in France, okay? So all, most of my examples are from high schools, but again, you can generalize that quite a lot. Um, so uh, before the reform, you had three basically general tracks 
for high school students. Uh, it would be scientific. You study math, physics, biology, perhaps. Um, you can uh, study uh, philosophy, literature, French, whatever, or economics and social sciences. That's a broad uh, summary. And um, someone, some people, decided that uh, having free might be not enough. And now they would change the system in that you can choose basically majors, like three of them, uh, and then you have to give up one and stick with two, okay? So basically you introduce more flexibility in the system, right? It's not a big change, not something that you expect to have very large um, impact. And it was proposed and everybody agreed that, okay, let's try that, okay? Um, my question to you now, what do you think is the effect on the gender gap in math of such a reform? It happens uh, some years ago in France. It's widely debated now, okay? So if you ask people, including myself, uh, before uh, it was implemented, you think, okay, who knows? It's gonna help some students uh, finding what they like. They can study more what they like, less what they like less. Should be like a good reform, no? Okay, so here's my question to you. So let's use your intuition, what we know about that. We are a crowd interested in uh, the gender gap in science. So what you see on that graph, I would translate it in French, but it's pretty easy to understand. So the, the first line is the share of women who reach the grade 12, okay? And when you go down, it's the number of hours of math they have uh, during their study, okay? So it's per week, okay? So you have 52% uh, who had three hours of math and more. If you go, can take even more math, which, which is six hours, and you can go up to eight hours, which is the maximum you can get, okay? So what you see is the evolution of the gender gap um, across time. And now there's a reform. It's a pretty simple reform. It's not something strange or uh, very big or whatever. So who wants to guess what happened? Just to prove you that your own intuition is perhaps not helping us a lot. So I couldn't have guessed that, and I think no one did. Uh, it's a big disaster, basically, to frame it in a simple way. It's a huge reform. It's, there are uh, it's like four years. It's probably one million girls who went through that reform. So it's one million girls who uh, went through the reform, and it uh, had a dramatic effect on the gender gap by creating a much larger gender gap than before, okay? And no one expected that. So it's not that simple. It's not like we can we know exactly what to do and what's going to happen next, okay? So what I want to uh, to point out here is that that very reform that wasn't thought about as anything related to the gender gap. It was thought to help students getting what they like at school um, had a major impact on the gender gap, creating a much larger one, okay? No one was expecting that. So our intuition is not helping much. That's my point here. Uh, let me move on to a, a different questions. We talked about intuition. Now I want to talk about scaling, okay? So I try every time to have uh, examples from, again, high school. Uh, the, the idea of role models, it's, it's a buzzword that comes again and again and again. Um, and it's a suggested way to increase the number of women in STEM, okay? So it's very simple and very nice idea, okay? Suppose I'm a girl, I'm not, as you have probably noticed. Uh, I sit in front of someone who was uh, sitting in my place some years before, who was very successful, and that person would explain how she did it, the path to get there, that can only help, okay? I would have someone who can tell me, okay, now maybe I can revise up my uh, chances of success. Sounds like a good idea, no? So that's some, probably something we should try. Again, our intuition suggests that it's a good idea. Is it? Okay, let's have a look. Um, it's called some, it's La Fondation L'Oréal. It's a French thing. They, they have something. They put quite a lot of money for girls in science, okay? So what they did is uh, they sent a successful female scientist as role model in high schools. And that intervention was analyzed by some colleagues. And they found a positive but small effect of role models on female students choosing scientific careers. So sounds like a good idea, okay? Okay, let's have a look. But when you look at the data, that's where at the ACIS National des Mathematiques, we were sort of disagreeing a bit on whether it's a good policy because my view is the, is the following. 
um, if you want to generalize that, you have first logistic and budget constraints. When you have successful scientists, they're not available full time to go to high schools. There are many high schools in France and in other countries too. Uh, and first, when you look at the data carefully, in fact, most of the effect is driven by two role models. So there were two su very successful women who were very good at attracting girls to science uh, careers, but two out of 56, which means that for some reason that it's hard to predict. Uh, 54 of them were sort of not doing much. Okay, can be bad. I mean, it's not a negative effect. It's just that basically doesn't help much. Okay, so if you want it to be successful, you have to select the right person. But of course, you don't know who the right persons are. Okay, so it's going to be difficult to generalize such a thing. So role model is not a bad idea. I'm not claiming I know what works and what doesn't work. What I'm claiming is that we are facing an empirical task. Okay, we have to uh, try things. We have to have a science of trying some things and learning from these trials and experiments. And that's my point here. Okay, so that was scaling. Um, let me tell you about some of the uh, problems we may have with uh, these interventions. So if you know about ENS, it's Ecole Normale Supérieure in France, it's more or less the top students, okay? So these guys are willing to help and they say, okay, we are willing to help unprivileged students uh, by giving them uh, lectures, special lectures. And so it's some tutoring. So they found some money, it's quite expensive, as you can tell. And uh, they worked hard on that. And it's something they wanted uh, to work, okay? Again, if I, you ask me, I would say, okay, very bright students, they want to help, they have the money to help, they are willing to spend time, this is something they want, should work, no? Okay, uh, no average effect, so nothing, doesn't work, why? Uh, we have to learn also from these failures, of course, uh, and they were among the few who tried to evaluate what they did, okay? So they, they provided the evaluation, which is, I think, uh, something that is not so common. Um, what happened basically is that students had to go to that school, which is downtown Paris, and they spent more time in public transportation, okay? And they also uh, liked it, what happened during this tutoring session. So they put their energy into the tutoring session and they forget somehow to work on other disciplines. So on average, their results went down, okay? But it sounded like a good idea, okay? So who could have guessed? So we have to uh, try that and we have to record a few things so that we can learn from these experiments. And that's what's missing now, I think. There are, of course, instances, more positive messages uh, down the road. Uh, so what I want to point out and insist on is that it's an empirical question, okay? That's something we need to solve by looking, trying, exp running experiments, okay? There's not something like reading uh, some uh, book, uh, some, uh, I don't know, philosophy, psychology, whatever, that would tell us exactly what's gonna happen next, okay? We have to try, we have to unite, join forces and try things and be clear about what works and what doesn't work, okay? So uh, also, if you interested in evaluation, and I think here, that's what we are looking for, uh, what you want, it's not just identify something that works, but you want to know what works best. Suppose you have $1 million to allocate to promote women in science. What would you do? Some things may work, but might be costly. Some things may work better. Okay, so that's something we want to uh, investigate. And again, put some science in that question. So in social sciences, we have developed a lot uh, of tools and work and uh, creativity and so on about causality, okay? So uh, what we want to uh, look at is, can we establish causality? How can we make sure that when we create some intervention, it's that intervention that created the positive effect we're expecting, okay? So the cool thing is that the last two decades, we seen a boom of these techniques, especially in economics. You may have heard the name of Esther Duflo. She got a Nobel Prize in economics exactly for uh, pushing up these techniques were there already, but not so popular and trying them at a very large scale. So she's among a team of economists who, uh, whose goal is to reduce poverty across the world. And they already tried things, exactly like we can try things for women in science. And they already had 1 billion individuals participating in their experiments. So it's at the world level now, okay? 
And uh, it's exactly the kind of tools we need to address the questions of the gender gap in science, okay? That's exactly the ones we should apply and they should work for that. And there are already some interesting experiments I would show you. Okay, so I don't have the time to cover all these things, there's a lot of developments, but the golden standard is RCT. What does RCT stands for? It stands for randomized controlled trials, okay? So basically, it's an idea I think everyone in science has in mind. You randomly select a control group and you randomly select a treatment group, okay? So you're going to be able to compare these things, so okay, to these two groups. And the, random, the randomness is exactly what we are looking for, okay? Because absent the randomness, you have the kind of programs we have now in France quite a lot, which is that you say, okay, I'm going to have this nice program. I what they call polytechnic. They have a small fraction of women. They want more women to join Ecole Polytechnic. Okay, what do they do? They say, okay, we're going to ask girls to come at Ecole Polytechnic during the summer so they can uh, get familiar with techniques, with the school, with people there, and so on. Very good, okay? Uh, nice idea, good intentions. But at the end of the day, who's going to come, okay? You're not going to randomly select people. It's people who apply for this because they heard about it. So perhaps they have a very well motivated uh, teacher who knew about that. Perhaps their parents heard about it. So somehow they are special, okay? And when you look at these special girls, guess what? They are doing well. But we can't compare them to the rest of the crowd. Why? Because they have been selected for a reason. They have been there for a reason, okay? If you look at people at the hospital, most of them are sick. No surprise, because they went to the hospital because they are sick, okay? So that's something we can all understand, and that's why we need that randomness. But the randomness is not something that is so easy to get in society, so we have to organize that most of the time. And it's not also something that people accept. Uh, I, I would say, at the first minute, they would say, oh, no, why you don't want, you want to select people at random? Why? I mean, that's exactly the opposite of what we're doing. We want to promote the best people. So why do you want to select them randomly? Or uh, we want to be... Uh, providing the same chances for everyone. So if you select randomly, you're basically breaking the rules. Some people just by chance would be entering the program and some would not. So this random element that we need to get causality is not so easy to get. And again, that's one more difficulty on the way to get a science of women in science or a clean evaluation of policies, right? Um, <clears throat> so maybe I won't be more optimistic by showing something, some things which do work, okay? So if we want to look at intervention, the ideal one, we would expect a large positive impact, okay? Not everything has that uh, property. We want few negatively affected persons. That's something that people forget most of the time. There are very few instances of a treatment that would have a positive effect for everyone. So positive effect for someone, no effect is okay, but positive effect for some people, negative effect for some others, on average, might be positive. But at the end of the day, you're harming some people. And that's not something you want. Or at least you don't want that too much. Okay? You want these things to be easy to generalize. Again, that's a constraint because if you have very well-motivated people, you need to hire a lot more people. Maybe they not have the same ideal, the same uh, goals in life and so on. So they're not so much involved, motivated to uh, get the work done. You don't have uh, infinite budget constraints and you want to evaluate the whole thing using your RCT. And if you look at these five things, they are important. I don't see a way around these things. Now think of all the initiatives you know, and there are many, many, many of them. How many of them satisfy these five uh, properties, okay? And I think that's why it's difficult to move on with a scientific methodology for that uh, very specific question of the gender gap, okay? Is that too demanding? Maybe you think, okay, <laughs> we can design the perfect experiment, but then at the end of the day, what can be done? So let me give you an example. Uh, I had a very nice graph, but I didn't want it to change the slide at the very last minute because it's already difficult to organize such things. Uh, but here is one, okay? So what you see on that graph is a very simple thing. Um, French high school again. So French high school, they give you highest honor, mention très bien, high honor, mention bien, honors, mention passable, no honor, you just uh, pass the bar, okay? So that's the end of, the, of high school and you get to university or whatever. And they ask uh, the students, uh, what is your expected grade, okay? It's about math. 
surprisingly enough, uh, if you look at the top students, what you see, the, the, the bold line is men, the dashed line is female, uh, they are underconfident, okay? And that's very, very, very widely uh, spread, okay? I wanted to show you a graph that it's, it's the same graph, but done all over the world with many, many more uh, number of observations. You always find that uh, average effect, which is that men are more confident, sometimes overconfident, and women are a bit underconfident, okay? So they are underconfident, okay? Again, it's pretty easy to uh, learn about that. Uh, what can be done and was done by some colleagues, it's, it's possible to provide feedback to students and tell you about their objective uh, ranking, okay? The, the French system works in a way that they allocate people into universities with a centralized uh, software. It's an algorithm that does that. And um, so basically that thing computes a ranking. It's a bit more complex than that, a lot more complex in fact, but more or less you can get a ranking, okay? Um, so what they did is they, they use that randomization thing. So they have a random sample of students. They receive objective information regarding their ability. Oops. What's going on? Session expiry. Should I keep on talking or? Yes. I keep going? Okay. Yes, I think we're still in. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, scary. Okay, so uh, you wanted to, uh, so some girls and boys received that information and some didn't, okay? And they randomly compare these two. So you have what we call counterfactuals. So now it's legitimate to compare these two because they are the same. And, 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 and my slides don't work anymore, but they, now they do. Okay. And that intervention itself closes about 60% of the gender gap in the likelihood of applying to elite programs, which in France are the ones leading to the science careers, okay? So as you can tell, it's simple, it's cheap, and it's easily scalable. And it's unlikely that providing objective information to students can harm them, okay? You think that somehow, on, from an ethical perspective, you want to change what they're going to do in life. So that's sort of a big uh, impact. So you don't want to mess up with this. So you think, OK, I'm going to provide objective information to some people so they know what it does exist. OK, and that's basically ticking all the boxes I was referring to. So th there are interventions that can have a big effect. They are cheap. It's easy. And you don't think you're harming too much people. OK, so we can generalize that idea. Uh, it's called targeting. So targeting information consists in providing objective information to women, could be some other public you want to address. For example, you can provide the, the position in the overall distributions, the likelihood to success. If you ask girl, is it possible that you're going to succeed uh, completing your PhD within four years? Uh, they are usually less confident than men. So you can say, okay, that's the objective numbers. Not everyone has these numbers in mind. Uh, and you can provide information at the individual level, okay, which seems to be more efficient. Uh, for example, uh, if you have these role model interventions, uh, you should read in front of a, an audience, a class or a larger group. Uh, it's We don't know so much what's going on. It's going to be positive for some people, maybe negative, and for most people, it doesn't do much, okay? But perhaps it would be better off, we would be better off if we can select the right people to get the right message, okay? It's a bit more uh, costly, but it's probably more successful, okay? Uh, and for once, intuition suggests that it's going to work, but if we look at uh, people who don't know that something does exist. That's where we expect the largest effect, okay? For example, I teach at Ecole Polytechnique. It's sort of the top school in France and so on. I'm not a former student and so on, so I haven't been a student there. So, okay, I just try to teach like in any school. And it's very surprising. You have uh, these students, their parents were there already, their grandparents and grand grandparents too. So they, they knew about it, you can tell. But some of them, you, you could be very surprised that uh, until the age of 17, for instance, they never heard about that school, which is quite famous in France. And luckily enough, somebody told them that, oh, but you seem to like science and there's that school here. It's quite good and you may like it. OK, so for once, intuition is OK. If you don't know that something does exist, it's 
happens. Hard in the case that you can choose it or you want to uh, get there, okay? So the largest effect is basically providing objective information to people you think are not aware of something existing, okay? Uh, and again, that's not a bad idea because it's unlikely that you're gonna harm people, okay? You have to pay attention to that and it's cheap, okay? Uh, maybe, what am I doing this time? I'm almost- yeah, you settle with some time for Q&A. Oh, right, all right, all right, all right. So uh, let me let me take some questions now and I can conclude later. Is that okay, right? Do you prefer to or you want to finish? Your... Oh, I can finish if you want, okay. Uh, so learning from past experience is difficult, okay? Uh, for example, uh, many interventions are not evaluated at all. So, so they do things and they, they say, okay, we had a terrific intervention. We do that in our school, for instance. Uh, it's a big success. We doubled the number of uh, students who had that treatment. Did it work? We don't know. But there are more people getting the treatment. Um, relevant indicators are not collected. You want to know if it works, you have to get the data to evaluate the thing, okay? So for instance, we have all these students, uh, young students coming into our programs to promote diversity. Uh, one year later, we don't know what happened to them. They're gone, so we don't know. So it's gonna be hard to evaluate. So there's more students getting in, but we don't know what happened to them, okay? Uh, heterogeneous treatment effect is the rule. Not everyone uh, received the treatment the same way, Just like medication, if you want. Evaluation can be biased. So we have selection bias, which is the thing I mentioned, which is you want to randomly select people to avoid the selection bias, which is that if you look only at people who self-select to the treatment, I'm a girl, I love math. Oh, there's a boot camp at Ecole Polytechnique. Oh, I'd love to go there. Okay, great. And then at the end of the day, she's going to be super successful, but she was meant to be successful already. So we're not learning much. Okay, false positive is an issue. Something that works once doesn't work all the time, okay? By luck, sometimes it works. So you'd like to have like several studies pushing in the same direction, but that's basic science. We all know about that, okay? Intuition based on simple examples may be misleading. Everyone has his favorite reform, okay? Every time I talk to someone, they say, oh, but we should pay attention to that. We should recreate that system. We should change that. We should do that. Everyone has an opinion. I do have my opinion, okay? But what matters is that we can confront these opinions to some objective facts, okay? Which is not what we are getting there now. Uh, last slide and I can take some questions. Um, there are reasons to be optimistic, I think. There's an increasing number of RCTs. So RCTs, as I said, is a sort of a golden standard, but it's also a way to convince, say, policymakers, to convince ourselves that we are looking at uh, good science. So that's an object to, to talk about. Uh, quantitative evaluation of public policies uh, improved greatly. As I said, Esther Duflo is the perfect example. Uh, and there is something like a culture, I would say, of evaluation. People start looking and thinking, oh, but at the end of the day, it's possible to run clean experiments in the social environment, okay? Uh, great on scientific successes. You have a lot of these papers now in good journals, in, including science, nature, and so on. So, Somehow it's spreading, I think, these uh, good practices. And that's my hope, is that the science of women in science uh, can be cumulative. We can learn across time and it can be rigorous. I mean, we can agree on the standards. We can agree that something works. We can agree on the criteria. We can do a lot of things together, okay? So that, that's my reasons to be optimistic. I'm done. So I'm happy to take some questions starting from there. Thank you very much. Should I move up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stay there, okay. Uh, promising or uh, uh, challenging for people to do some evaluations through the uh, random, you know, sampling. Yes, yes. That, yeah. Okay, so uh, any questions from the floor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just a question. Um, of course, when as a professor, we try to select the best talent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is, maybe this could be Convention because your comments can be men and women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you think that when you select this and divide this into the strategy for humans, may fail? Uh, why is it that it's? it's uh, I'm not sure. You may need to rephrase the uh, question because the people you online. Need to, need to yeah, yeah, well, I'm not sure I got it right. <laughs> you, you said that you, you changed for a random process. Oh, yeah. Because uh, when you go for a, a normal talent, yes, treatment, 
Yes. We may jeopardize or, or oh yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So but literally we selected for the best talent mm -hmm. the same for men and women. Why you think that they what we are, are applying for men does not apply to women? If I understand the question correctly, is uh, let, let's compare two systems. The, the, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, one of them is as professors, we select the talents because we are able to observe who say good at math or whatever, and uh, it's nothing it has nothing to do with a random allocation. Okay, and uh, how can we compare that system to a purely random allocation? Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, what is the benefit of each? Okay, so random allocation is something you need if you want to have a clean design in the sense that you would be able to compare two groups, okay? So if I want to know if as a teacher I'm doing well, okay? Uh, for instance, it would be nice to compare me to another teacher and randomly allocate students to each teacher, okay? Because if I teach to students who selected to come to my class, uh, they may have reasons to get there because they like me better than the other teacher or they may go to the other teacher. And uh, we don't know about these reasons, okay? So the, 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 the magic, I would say, of uh, randomization is that it works for uh, criteria you do not observe, okay? Suppose um, probably it's, I think, uh, what was done, for example, by Pasteur, he, he wanted to prove that the vaccine was effective. So he divided a group of animals, sheep mostly, into two groups, and he, vaccine, he gave the, the, the disease to everyone and vaccinated some and not the others. And the next day, the vaccinated ones were alive, the, the others were, were dead, okay? But obviously, you need to randomize the sheep because if, for example, say, female sheep don't uh, are immune to the, the disease and the male sheep are not, if you put female and male on, on each side, well, you're missing something basically. So you need to randomize because randomization is what grants you the possibility to control, as we say, for some things we do not observe yet, okay? And that's why we lack these randomization elements so much. And we basically, all our students now are screening the, the world to find this randomization somehow, uh, just exactly to get the, these counterfactuals that we need, okay? That's the reason, but that's a need, teachers, are probably doing a great job and they have a lot of information on their students. But one thing is to promote talents. The other thing is to compare uh, two treatments, okay? And that's the purpose is not exactly the same, right? There was a, another question, I think. Yes, I was just wondering, is it possible to find ways of using negative results? Because oh, yeah. what you showed about the, the randomized study made by your government mm -hmm. uh, is very impressive. So, in some sense, it's, of course, the result was exactly the opposite of what you wanted. Yes. <laughs> but that tells you that doing something like this can have a huge effect. Yes. And, and so, how do you, be, I mean, this is a difficult question <laughs> in, in, in science. We're trying to achieve something, we achieve the opposite. Yeah. We're like, wow, I hit on something. Yeah. But I did it the wrong way. Yeah. No, no, uh, let me go back to, it's very interesting, uh, to that. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I should repeat the question. Can we learn from what I've failed, okay? So that experiment is not exactly an experiment in the sense that it applied to everyone. They're not randomizing anything. They just change the way we do things. So the, the, the next step, I haven't talked about that much, but since you offer me the, the opportunity to do that, is that <laughs> we do see that it went down, Obviously, I mean, uh, I said a lot of things about uh, randomizing and so on. Obviously, there you can tell that the reforms had a huge impact without evaluating anything. So why evaluating? Because we just look at the graph, obviously there's an effect. Uh, the thing is, we don't know what happened yet, okay? Why is this happening, okay? Showing that something happened, okay, is already important, but why is it happening? We don't know yet. What happened? Why did girls uh, run out of math? Why did they, they, they give up on math? Why? That's the thing we understand so far. And since it wasn't meant to be evaluated, that action, okay, there's little chances we're going to uh, learn about that. We have to collect data uh, from the past. Maybe the, the data were not stored correctly. Nobody wanted to evaluate these things ex ante before the reform even happened. And that's exactly the message here is, when you try something, make sure you collect enough data so that you can at least get an idea of what happened, what worked, what didn't work. Here, 
they didn't collect much data, okay? And in France, but probably in other countries too, it's hard to get clean data and people who have, uh, like researchers, no reason to be on one side or the other who just want to do science. So independent evaluation of such reforms is still not so feasible in France, okay? Just to, and it took four years to realize that it was going the wrong direction, which is amazing, I mean. Yeah, okay. I think uh, there is a question. There are some questions yeah. coming from the uh, 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 oh, webinar okay. online. So maybe I know uh, uh, Jillian also wants to ask questions. Mm -hmm. We go to first. Mm -hmm. We still have time. Yeah. So two questions have come in. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to come to the? So uh, mm -hmm. he doesn't need to repeat, or or you no, could I, just open it from your computer to state the So we we get two questions that come in on chat, and the first one was. In the personalized evaluation program you presented, how do you ensure objectivity? Is it documented that teachers are not? Which program, sorry? The personalized evaluation program that you presented. The personalized evaluation program? Because you provide a special uh, guidance to the uh, students of that when they turn that's more into uh, that's the one you just yes. ah uh the one and then how do you ensure they're asking? How do you ensure objectivity? Um, no, 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 not this one. The other one, the previous one. Here? No, 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 no. Oh, uh, that one? The one with feedback? Yes, exactly. That one? Uh, Ah, objectivity is about the information they receive, right? How do, how do I know that it's objective information? Correct. Right. They're saying teachers are, are shown to not, it's documented that teachers are not objective. All oh, right, right. Oh, okay, I understand. Okay. Uh, so the question is, what do I mean by objective information exactly here? Okay. Objective information in that precise context, it's a very French thing, is that because you have that algorithms that allocates basically all students, almost a million of them in two universities and so on, they have to enter grades and so on, okay? And based on these grades, past uh, grades, grades from baccalaureate and so on, you can compute sort of a ranking based on past observations. That's why it's somehow objective. So the question is, for example, let's concentrate on uh, access to these elite programs, okay? You can tell with a little bit of a machine learning uh, thing, uh, what is the likelihood with uh, these grades you're going to enter these elite schools, okay? So that's the probability associated to your grades. And that thing is based on an observation from the past that, say, if you get uh, a good grade in math, that's your chance to get into that program. And that's the objective refers to uh, how much you can predict what's going to happen given your grades to the chances you get into these programs. Well, maybe the last question, uh, Gillian raised uh, mm -hmm. her hand. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, before you, yeah, so uh, Gillian wants to, Gillian. Oh, you have a second question. We have a second question online. So just so you guys know, there's about 50 people watching this online. So, sure, sure, sure. Uh, can I go ahead? And just yeah, please. The second one is a little bit lengthy. Uh, She says, uh, Professor Holler is sort of suggesting that we need to run the experiment with control groups and have randomness in selection of those that are not going to be given the placebo. Now, if you are introducing a new policy, doesn't the whole population in the past participate in the control group? Can't we compare the whole group now under the new policy with the whole group from before? No, that's a very good question. <laughs> okay, so the question would be, uh, so let, let me go back to my slides because um, that would be interesting. Uh, if, for example, I look at that graph, um, that's exactly what I was suggesting. Can't we evaluate by just comparing what was going on in the past, okay? Uh, sure, that prov provides a lot of information already, okay? Suppose exactly it went even more down or something like this. The problem is we want to make sure that uh, there are other things that happened at the same time. For example, you had COVID at the time, Okay, and uh, students had to stay home. Okay, so how can you make sure that what we are observing here is not the effect of COVID, but the effect of the reform? So we want to single out the effect of the reform. That's why it's better 
when possible. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not always possible. We can still learn from uh, even studies, as, as we call them. Uh, but there are these problems, uh, confounds, basic confounds, that some of the things are happening at the same time. The world is not the, exactly the same as last year. So, or to reframe the, the, the whole thing, in social sciences, usually what we do is to compare what's going on, say, in France to other countries. So we think, okay, in other countries, they were able to achieve that, they are able to do that. So we compare across space and we can compare across time. So if you ask teachers, especially, they say, oh, 20 years ago, students were much better and so on. So that's what we do. And what we try to introduce here is some causality in the present, in the sense that if you randomize, you can learn from the very population you are studying, not referring to the past or to uh, other countries. Okay, I think the time is up. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. You're and welcome. Think, yeah, you will stay here for a while. So people, will, will have, if you have more questions, we uh, ask you later. Yeah. Okay. So, so Thank uh, you very much for your presentation. Thank you. So, uh, Let's go to the um, the third session. Oops. Okay. So for the uh, third session, we have uh, two speakers. The first one is uh, Sylvia Debel, and she's a professor uh, in the area of uh, applied mathematics at the University of uh, Lely. And she also uh, completed her three-year PhD in statistics from Sorbonne Sob University in 2002. And she <laughs> chaired the uh, EMS uh, CDC uh, uh, in 2019 to 2022. She's de deeply uh, involved and committed to uh, promoting the mathematics and the women in mathematics. And the second uh, speaker is uh, Rachel uh, Ivy, and she's a senior research fellow in science and the society at the American Institute of Physics. Um, Dr. Ivy uh, earned her uh, doc, uh, PhD in sociology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She recently serves as the director of the API, AIP Statistical Research Center and is a fellow of the American Astronomical Society. And she was involved in our uh, global women uh, uh, global uh, gender gap project uh, during the period uh, from uh, 2017 to 2019, and help us out uh, out on the data analysis. So um, now, please uh, join me to welcome uh, Sophie uh, to come to the stage for your talk. And then uh, after yours, that would be Rachel's. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, let me thank you for the for uh, inviting me to this meeting. Um, it is okay. Oh, can I speak loudly? <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so here I'm going to focus on on mathematics and in Africa. Um, so with Marie Francoise. Um, Marie Francoise Bedrabogo, who is uh, the chair of AUMA, African Women in Mathematics, Maria Esteban, and um, Colleague Guillaume. So, we uh, analyze uh, the results of the global survey um, by focusing on, first of all, in mathematics and then after that on the African continent. Um, so, let me just show you. So, so, as you know, there was more than a thousand. Uh, people who answered to the survey and uh, the uh, gender distribution was um, very fair, 50-50. Um, so we did not have access compared to other colleagues to the individual data. So uh, we have access of on aggregated data on a platform. Um, and this aggregation and uh, optimizing of the data permit to not have access to individual data. Uh, and to do that, so some filtering has been used instead uh, in, in order to avoid having access to, for instance, in some places at the world, for instance, in, in Senegal, where you have one or two people answering to the questions. So we extract uh, by using some SQL queries, uh, frequency tables related to questions we ask for. So, but at the first place, we collect all the data in order to have a more exhaustive 
database around uh, the, uh, the net nine sorry thematics uh, we had. Um, so let me just take some minutes to explain how the data were minimized and uh, the kind of data set we had at disposal and how we analyze this in a statistical point of view. So like I said before, first of all, a filtering has been used, meaning that, oh, not very loud. Okay, it is better now. I captain, I speak very slowly. Okay, so first of all, a filtering has been uh, done by not us, but the people who are hired to, uh, to anonymize the data. So we go through the technical process of this uh, filtering and then see that the data, so the original data uh, has been, um, let's say, um, modified a little bit. So a Gaussian noise has been added and uh, a low filtering also has been done in order to avoid, like I said before, having access to infrequent data or uh, very few data set. For instance, you are asking some question regarding the data because you are interested to know the gender, um, gender gap related to some question and then you have less than four observation, then you will not have access to this data because the filtering process will avoid that, okay? Um, so, and we realize also that if you are asking very complicated questions. So regarding the fact that at each question, if you have few data, there is a filter, so the data are noisy, then the more complicated the question you have, the more the data are filtered. And then you may have sometimes no data set or very few data set. And in this case, in fact, we have, um, we have some information saying that, okay, here you have a star because the data is not, let's say, very realistic because there are a lot of noises, etc. So uh, at the end, so we just um, for some specific question we had, we uh, construct queries by first of all taking variables with less, um, like a yes or no, less answers, and then add at the end um, the questions with more. Uh, more number of um, of possible response. So that's why we, if you have um, if you have to work with this um, aggregated data, we recommend to construct first of all a very simple query by placing first of all the categorical variables where you have few answers, and then the more complicated one at the end, but avoiding to have more um, let's say a combination a complicated combination of of, of queries. So at the end, what, what you have, if you ask the platform to um, give you some data set regarding, for instance, sexual harassment in Africa uh, for a kind sort of subset of the population, then you have a table, a categorical table where some answers regarding the question may be yes or no, uh, I select the question or no, et cetera. And then you have numbers like, uh, See numbers and one example, maybe this one, for instance, if you ask, have you got sexual harassment at school or at work, then people se uh, select, selected or not selected. And then if you have this question and you combine this question with another one, for instance, TA, <coughs> then you may have a table and the gender, of course. You may have a table with three colon. The first one is question, sexual harassment. Uh, you will have to, you, you want to have the repartition, uh, the distribution regarding the gender and the HDA, then you might have a table like this. This is a very simple query. And then uh, here I hide the numbers that I put stars, but at the end you may have a colon with the numbers. Okay, and sometimes you may have a star, a star meaning that here the results is very, the number of uh, response is very few, so we are hiding. Okay, so based on this, we have several tables like this. So at first place, since we had access to the platform during six months, if I remember well, so we ask a lot of questions regarding the nine thematic and then we stop all the data set because we were not at that time uh, sure about the interesting question we will ask or we would like to investigate that afterward we go through all the nine uh, thematic with the help of an internship 
and uh, uh, we analyze um, the descriptive data, we go through multivariate analysis, et cetera, and then we select the question where we uh, see real gender gap. So um, just to explain, if you are interested to more technical detail, we can share. Then we did so, I said, first of all, we have the tables, the tables with the numbers, with the proportion, let's say numbers or proportion, because we um, transform uh, everything with proportion. Um, so we just look at a distributive analysis, like um, the proportion of male or female regarding a specific question. Uh, and since this is not sufficient to say that uh, the proportion is high for male or female, if you have 1% difference, et cetera, then we statistically test if these differences are, um, are significant using the well-known, uh, so using the usual um, um, probability of, of, of error, 5%. Um, and then after that, you now we select some question where we see that there is something, uh, some gender gap. And to confirm this, we use multivariate analysis. So somehow we are interested to um, to look at some confounding factors, okay? But the problem, not a, not a problem, but the complication here is that the data set are not individual. Usually when you do such analysis, a data set or a line on observation is an is based on an individual or person. But so here it was based on a group of person. So we adapt uh, the classical, we adapt. We use um, um, multivariate model that are able to, that were able to to take into account the fact that the data are aggregated. They are aggregated. Just to give you more detail. So if you support that, uh, if you think about the, the, the table, I show you on sexual harassment, gender and HDA, and then uh, you, uh, consider that this table comes from a random variables or mathematical object. I will call x1, x2 to xd. D mean that the number of um, questions or uh, confounding factors we would like to investigate and why the binary variable male or female, for instance. Uh, so what in the multivariate analysis, what we are interested was to um, so highlight the uh, the categorical variables, the confounding factors based on the gender. So we, are, we were um, doing that by uh, prob estimating the probability of Y be being equal to one, for instance, male or female, it doesn't depend, knowing, uh, knowing um, the confounding variables here. So, and then to do that, you, like I said, usually, you estimate this by taking a dumple. And the dumple are individuals. Since the dumple here are not individuals, then uh, the data we observe, like let's say we have N individuals, you have N people answering to, to these questions regarding the, um, the confounding variables you have here. And these N people are aggregated in N group. Like the table I show you, each line is a group. And each group has a number of individual and J. Uh, and then we want to estimate such probability, okay? So we use, um, we estimate such probability taking into account the fact that we have aggregated data. Namely, this is what, this is that a modelization of the table I showed you before, where you have the confounding factors here, the number of individual in each. This is, this was the stars I had. And these somehow are realization of, um, accounting random variables here, binomial uh, random variable, I call capital N, okay? And based on that, so we uh, we use the software to estimate this probability and then highlight the, the confounding factors uh, that may cause gender gap, okay? And let me show you some of the results, first of all, in mathematics and then in, in Africa. So, so globally, what we've, found uh, in Africa regarding the nine uh, thematic and so in mathematics, sorry, in mathematics regarding this uh, nine thematic was that uh, we did not have very significant difference between mathematics and the other disciplines. Even if for some question we may see 
some some differences um, globally. You know, there are no huge difference between mathematics and the other disciplines. Uh, so, like I said, here we go through the nine um, team you have here, from secondary degrees to um, to sexual harassment. Um, and one thing I would like to point out is that uh, you know that there are several uh, surveys um, or um, article published um, regarding gender gap that address uh, specific questions. Um, but here, uh, one of added value of uh, this um, uh, gender gap survey is that uh, it permit to measure work-life balance, family support, um, access to resources, or, or sexual harassment. Uh, and uh, I will go. I will try to emphasize on this point in, in mathematics, um, first of all, and uh, um, in in Africa. But all the other questions have been also analyzed, and uh, we will try to share it uh, with the data with the visualization um, website we are working on. So um, globally, um, as I said before, uh, the percentage of people answering to the uh, to the survey was like 50-50. The difference was very small regarding the gender. And uh, this is what you have here. But if you go into detail, so in mathematics, we uh, separate mathematics and applied mathematics. Okay, as the first place, we, it was, we combine both of them. But uh, finally, we decide to separate and we we'll see if behaviors in applied mathematics um, are different in, 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 in mathematics. Okay. Yes, applied mathematics is a subset of, uh, of mathematics. You know, to see that if applied mathematics, we have behaviors. Uh, which are and then uh, the distribution is um, a little bit different to, uh, to global, but not so, so, so much. Uh, for instance, in maths, and you have more uh, more male than, than female. Like, uh, and in applied math, in specific, uh, it's a little bit the contrary. As uh, I said, we not have I don't have time to go into details all the questions, so I will just on one of them. Uh, but just remind that globally, uh, in mathematics, the results are not very different to uh, the rest of the disciplines. So uh, if you look at the question who must encourage you in your, in your studies, and then uh, the selective response, we had a, a number of selective response like uh, your own determination, uh, willpower hard work or parents or spouse or partner or, or teachers. Uh, and we compare, you have here, um, that I think it's not very clear at the end. You can see you have all sciences. We have mathematics and applied mathematics. So two subset of this one. Um, and like the, the own in all sciences, um, own determination, the females, uh, female are, um, so um, they encourage themselves by their own determination. They are, um, they are hard worker not more than uh, males, but globally, they are uh, very supportive, supported by parents, their own determination, a little bit less for by teachers. And this is, um, uh, I will show you for Africa, this is a little bit um, critical for Africa. So in global um, um, and schools and partners, uh, they are more supportive for female, uh, especially in, in the global part, in all sciences. Uh, but also in math and, and applied math. Now, if you look at um, um, the question on what was your primary advisor, advisor male or female? So um, the result is that female um, advisors are less than for both male and female. And the female, they have significantly more female advisor than male. Um, and if the proportion is a little bit smaller in, in mathematics. And this closed the case also in applied math. Um, so if we also uh, have a look of uh, the interruption during the PhD studies, studies sorry, um, all sciences, mathematics, and applied mathematics again. Um, so the proportion of female who answer without surprise is, is higher for, for female. And uh, what I show here, you have only the proportion, but like I said before, 
we also compare if these difference these are very are significant by doing a test, okay, statistical test with, with a certain level of, of error. Um, we also look at the funding. If people, they during their research, they have enough, uh, enough funding or um, access to, um, to enough space of their office, et cetera. So here, if I, if I show the results of funding um, in, again, all sciences, math and, and applied mathematics, uh, we find that female are, um, they, have, they are less satisfied than male in, in, in funding. Uh, travel money also support um, as working parents. Um, so uh, regarding the interruption, the main reason for interruption, if I only focus on the sexual harassment, um, also without surprise, so females suffer from it uh, less in math uh, than in applied math, but the proportion is here very small compared to what we have before. Uh, so continuing in, in sexual harassment. So uh, the first question was during, um, because of the interruption, do you think that this interruption is related to sexual harassment? While here we, uh, the question is, have you ever encountered sexual harassment at school or, uh, or at work? And uh, so people have to select, yes, it, it, it happened to me or it doesn't happen to me. And also without surprising, there are no so much difference between math and, and all sciences. And then uh, globally, we see that um, uh, the answer is, uh, is, is really true for female uh, compared to male. Okay, now let's uh, see some of these question in, in Africa. Yeah, speaker, so yeah. We have I'm going to, sorry. Yeah, uh, on Africa and, and elsewhere. Um, uh, so, a huge number also will answer, even if it is small compared to all the answers, uh, with 1% of female. And globally here, I summarize the results and I have time, I will show you some images. Um, so what we notice that in average the age of African women who answer to the survey is a little bit more than for male. And uh, uh, people who also answer to the survey, um, they had the master degree. This they have a master degree and um, uh, the number um, and length of interruption along the career uh, is higher for female than male. Um, one interesting thing is also in Africa, men are more often married to unemployed women than elsewhere compared to, to women. Um, yeah, just to show you some results. So here I, I highlight parents and partner because in Africa, um, compared to the first part is general and the other one is Africa, compared to the rest of the world, okay, the parents are more supportive for female than uh, teachers or uh, community or friends, okay? So here, this is what point in Africa, women feel much less supported than men by their teachers and mentors uh, compared to the rest of the world, but they are more supportive by their parents. Uh, so here I can just keep because we don't have enough time. So uh, to visualize all, so to share with, uh, with the community all the results, we are working on a platform, online platform, where all the, for all the questions, not all the questions because there are a lot of, but some questions where we see really a gender gap in Africa and also in mathematics and all sciences. Uh, so we are building a, um, a website. I think that soon we, it, will be, it will be open online. And we are also preparing two articles to be published. We don't know yet where on mathematics and Africa. And uh, uh, these are some conclusion on, um, on uh, the results we, uh, we already have on, uh, on, um, in global, but also for Africa and, and, um, and in, uh, in mathematics. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We just go to the next one and read the questions to the end. Otherwise, we may not have enough time for Rachel. So, oops. Yeah. Um, okay, so Rachel, you could start. 
Mayhan, can I use do my own slides because I've made a few changes? Uh, okay. I can yes, share my screen. I'm ready to share. Understood. I think you could put that into presentation mode. My computer is slow. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Um, so I am Rachel Ivey. I am from the United States, and um, I'm here today to present our, the results for physics, which I'll do after this. But first, I want to present um, results for, on the gender gap in STEM in Chile, also in Latin America. Um, I did not do this work, but I'm presenting um, on behalf of my colleagues, Andrea Vera um, and Maria Isabel Cortez, uh, both from Chile. And you, they also used the um, SQL database that was anonymized that Sophie talked to, talked to you about. So um, when you see in the, in the slides, uh, you see, and there's gonna be a reference to that. This means the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile. So, let me tell you the work that my colleagues did. Um, first of all, at, this, at the university, there is a public policy competition which tries to generate concrete proposals to, um, for solutions to um, evaluate public policies in order to provide evidence to decision makers and contribute to the national public discussion. So my colleagues, um, entered this competition. The result of it is a publication in a book, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and to talk about public policy and how it should be um, implemented in Chile, they focused on the gender gap in STEM. They did an evaluation of three different data sources. The first is um, how, what is people's access to STEM careers and how do they graduate? How often do they graduate? Their data source was from the Ministerio de Education, the Education um, Ministry. And they also analyzed the participation of women in science and technology in funding competitions from the National Fund for Scientific and Technological Development. And they analyzed critical nodes for the access, permanence, and progress of women in STEM. And for this, they used the gender gap studies. So today I'm going to um, focus on the results from the gender gap survey. But if you want to know more about the data that they used and how they looked at uh, funding for women and then uh, the rates of women in higher education and STEM careers, you can look at their paper, which I'll show you that in a minute. Um, based on their evaluation, they um, defined some proposals that I'm gonna present for you today, proposals to um, in the gender gap in STEM. So in, in the evaluation for Chile, they focused on the graduation rate, entrance rate, we've already discussed that. And um, for using the global data, they uh, focused on the difficulties in the retention of women, progression and retention of women in academic careers in STEM areas. So um, in these results, the authors compare the data from Chile uh, to the data from Latin America and then to the OECD countries. And most of you may know this, but um, just a reminder, here are the OECD countries. This stands for the organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It has 38 member countries, including Chile, um, which you can see there on the map. So here is one of the questions that Sophie um, showed you. This shows the results uh, for women and men who responded that they had encountered sexual harassment. 
you can see that the um, uh, percentages for women reporting uh, sexual harassment are higher than those for men. This down here is the percentage of people who said no. So men were more likely to say no than women. Uh, the percentages were about the same for Chile and Latin America, um, but they were a little bit lower than in the OECD countries. So see your next slide. So maybe you want to put that into a presentation mode without the next slide, because on the screen we have you, the current slide, and the next slide. Uh-oh, you... with yeah. my notes probably, right? Yeah. Let me, <laughs> let me, may hung up, in the interest of time, let me fix it before I, um, when Are I, we... when I go to the next presentation. People could say that, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, the uh, current one is too small to read. Okay. If, well, I can stop sharing. If you, yeah. You'd like for me to stop sharing? Let me try again. Yeah, I'm not sure. What are you That's saying? That's great. Yeah. That's okay, great. I'm not, Thank I'm you not very sure. much. I can thank you. I'm not sure you can see this very well anyway, um, but this is the, uh, Sophie showed you the question, Did have you taken a significant uh, career break or career interruption? And then people who said um, yes were given this follow-up question, um, which turned out to be important in uh, my colleagues' analysis. Um, have you taken, did you take this career break in order to care for family members? You can see that um, the bottom row in each set is the percentage who said no. Um, men who had taken career breaks, uh, none of them said they had done it for family reasons, but the percentages were, um, were higher for women who had taken career breaks for family members. The first row being maternity or paternity leave, and then um, children, but not as associated with other uh, sorry, not associated with maternity. And then this missing row here is um, for other family members. So you can see the percentage who had taken um, inter interruptions to care for family members is about the same in Chile as in all of Latin America. And then, but it's a little bit lower than in the OECD countries. But still women were more likely than men to take um, a career break to care for family members. So those are just two of the charts that they had to, that they used the gender gap data, the survey data. Here are the proposals to um, reduce the gender gap in Chile. Um, they encourage, they say that the um, people should encourage uh, women to enter into STEM careers. They found that uh, the STEM areas that had a, what they called a higher mathematical component had fewer women and that included physics, math, engineering, and computer science. Um, the second was to generate support for the academic trajectories of women, and they encourage uh, the people to uh, extend the tenure clock, take into account reasons for other career interruptions, not just maternity, and then incentivize institutions to implement these policies. This is something that we also need in the United States. Um, and then finally, uh, to improve the work climate and deal with problems of harassment and violence, because people cannot do the, um, their best science if they're um, dealing with these situations. The products they had from this um, analysis was first at the book that I already mentioned. Um, this says proposals for Chile, and their chapter is chapter four, which is uh, the gender gap in STEM careers. And so the paper is available. Um, it is in Spanish, but if you want to learn more about their analysis and the other aspects, not just using the global survey, you can look at that paper. Um, they were also invited to um, hearings on different commissions of the Chilean parliament. And here's um, our co-authors uh, down here in this uh, corner, I believe it's Dr. Vera, presenting the um, results on sexual harassment that I just showed you. Finally, 
they um, were invited to discuss a draft law on parity and research projects, because remember they looked at uh, disparity in funding in the national Chilean competitions for scientific funding. And so this uh, discussion occurred in September of 2022. I don't know the outcome of the law, but um, I think that is um, a great use of the gender survey data and uh, the other data that they looked at. So uh, again, these were the results of my um, colleagues and Next, I'm gonna to switch to uh, present, present about physics. Let me go here. I've got to change my PowerPoint. Should have made it into one. No, that's, that didn't work. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble with my mouse. Rachel, did you send your slides to uh, Rusia? Yeah, she could help. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my my slides? With uh, you're probably seeing me, and it, well, I'm not sure what you're saying. Uh, we are now saying, could you please uh, put your slides on full screen? Okay. You could see the the uh, power the the whole PowerPoint. Uh, software window we would prefer them to see them full screen so that we can actually yeah. read i apologize my mouse um went That's crazy perfect. for a minute okay um so now i want to talk about the results for physics um i did this with my uh, colleague uh, susan white at the american institute of physics in the united states um marie francoise has already shown you this uh, these were our, the research questions for the survey. I wanted to emphasize uh, in this which ones we're going to be looking at today. So you'll see in red, um, we're going to be looking at the access to resources needed to conduct science, because if the resources are unequally distributed, then um, women cannot advance their careers. Also, we want to look at work-life balance, because um, most societies assign the work of child care and housework and family care to women. And how does that affect women's careers in physics? And then uh, we wanted to look at the experiences in careers, specifically sexual harassment that we've already looked at in two of the other talks. Down there, we also looked at demographics. And you can think of demographics in this as our independent variables. Uh, and the ones in red are going to be our dependent variables. So like Sophie, we also did multivariate analysis to show um, the different things that uh, could affect our three dependent variables, which were access to resources, the work-life balance, and sexual harassment. So the uh, confounding variables that we looked at were um, age, which is a proxy for career stage, because for example, with resources, the longer you've been a scientist, um, the more likely you are have to have had resources. Employment sector, not everyone in, this, uh, in the survey was in academics. There were some people who were in industry or government. We also um, looked at the level of human development according to the United Nations to look at differences across countries. 
because the level of human develop, development in the geographic region is going to have an effect on your access to resources, your work-life balance. And um, we didn't know about sexual harassment, but we tested that just in case. So all the differences I'm going to report are statistically significant at this uh, P level, which we made lower than the 5% because um, we were doing so many tests, we made a statistical correction um, to, to make it even more difficult to pass that test. So we asked people about their access to resources. We had 12 of them. Everything that has a star was where women had uh, reported less access than men. So women had less ac access to funding. They had less access to clerical support than men less access to employees or students and less te technical support. And also like Sophie, Sophie mentioned for her results in physics, people had less support, women had less support as a working parent. So each of these as dependent variables showed a gender difference controlling for the other confounding variables that I showed you. We also added them up in a scale so that the scores could range from zero where you had no resources to 12. And we found that um, using the scale as the dependent variable, men reported uh, 0.4 more resources than women. This difference may seem small, but it compounds over your career. This is what sociologists call the accumulation of disadvantage, where say, for example, you start out with um, less, less support and then you apply for a grant, but you don't get it. So you don't have the funding. So you, you have less equipment, less of these things, and then, it just accumulates over your career until um, after a couple of years, after several years, there's a, a gender gap in career progression, um, which is one of the things I want to show you. I wanted to point out that when we looked at these individually, there were no instances in women when which women were more likely than men to say they had enough. So it was either women said they had less than men or there was no gender difference. We asked them how their career changed because of their, they were a parent. This is a measures of work-life balance. Uh, women were much more likely than men to say that they had changed their careers because of, um, because of becoming a parent. They spent significantly less time at work. Um, they, but while they were at work, they had to become more productive and efficient. And in the, um, they also were more likely than men to report that their career or rate of promotion slowed significantly. We have another measure of that that I'm going to show you in a minute. In fact, uh, women were more than three times likely than men to say that their career or rate of promotion slowed significantly because they were parents. Men, on the other hand, down in this last row, were more likely to say, three times more likely than women to say their careers didn't change at all when they became parents. Um, this is another measure of career progression. We asked, this uh, question has been asked, Marie Francoise mentioned that there have been global studies just of physicists. So this has been asked in every global study of physicists. And we have always found the um, same results. Women with children are the most likely to report um, that their career was progressing more slowly than men with children and then people without children. This shows you again, the effect of um, child care um, on women's careers in, in physics. We've seen the same results um, for Latin America and um, in Sophie's results, women are more likely than men to say they have encountered sexual harassment at school or work. They're more likely to say they, um, that it happened to them, more likely to say that they saw it happening or that they heard about it. Men down there in the last row were the most likely to say that uh, they did not encounter sexual harassment at school or work, which means that um, in terms of doing science, women have um, this additional obstacle that they have that they have to deal with. The conclusions are that there is evidence of a gender gap in physics for respondents in this study, very similar to the other um, results that you've seen. Women may receive fewer resources to do their work that um, accelerates over their careers. And um, also with family obligations, you'll see a gender gap in career progression of women, of women physicists in this study. And then sexual harassment is a concern for many women in physics, 
I wanted to say something about career progressions, um, which is that there are, have been studies in the United States that uh, talked about the um, likelihood of people getting tenure. Our, our measure was subjective, you know, did your career progress more slowly? But it supports this other work where uh, the researchers have found that women with children are less likely than other people to um, advance, get tenure and to advance up the faculty ranks. So I wanted to thank you for your kind attention. My apologies for my problems with my slides. Um, I'm, I'm in the United States right now, and this is earlier than I usually get up. Um, Marie Francoise and May Hung uh, for leading the project. John Tyler, who did the analysis. Um, the questionnaire is available on the Gender Gap uh, Project and on our website. But like Marie Francoise said earlier, these slides are going to, this is recorded so you can get the, the links uh, later. So again, thank you very much. Okay, could you stay uh, online? Oh, I think the time is up, but I think I still like to uh, uh, ask whether or not people have a question, at least one or two for the presenters to get some feedback. So uh, Carol, maybe this time we, uh, do you have any uh, questions from, from the chat box? If not, I will ask the uh, persons and participants on site. Okay. Uh, just to comment that only time is going to be limited. Okay, so maybe uh, one question uh, from the on site. Do you, does anybody want to ask a question now? Okay, if not, then let's uh, move to the uh, next one. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, Sophie and uh, Rachel for the presentation. Okay, now uh, we could have uh, uh, Lucia. Um, I think you have a slide yes. to present. Uh, yes, yes. <coughs> thank you very much. Okay, uh, our last but not the least uh, presenter is uh, Helena Mihajecic. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, she's a mathematician uh, by training, uh, and she's also the professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Berlin. And her research interest uh, lies at the intersection of mathematics and data science and uh, science and technology uh, studies. And I think her work uh, seeks to develop new and uh, improve existing computational methods in data science while helping to inform decisions on um, policies and the practices to support equity and uh, social justice. So um, uh, Helena helped us on the uh, publication uh, analysis for the uh, Global Gender Project, and they, have very, and they have been very helpful. So I think she's going to share some uh, new results uh, for the uh, gender gap in publication patterns. So uh, Helena? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Lucia, maybe you could help to um, to play the video, Re pre-recorded. Yeah, and the she will come out uh, at the end to answer the questions if we, there is any. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, let's uh, move to the beginning. Please stay tuned. Uh, hello, everybody. Unfortunately, I cannot be um, here today for the full session, but only for the Q&A. So I have pre-recorded um, this short video, which is about uh, recent research with my PhD student, uh, Christian Steinfeld, on uh, collaboration practices in mathematics and um, the possible effects of gender. So when we talk about collaboration, we mean um, co-authorship, 
So we look at publication data and um, co-authorship is presumably the most important form of collaboration in mathematics. Um, if we look at uh, data from uh, indexing and reviewing services in mathematics, um, so mathematical reviews and ZBMath, we see that uh, research is nowadays built as group effort in mathematics. Um, so in the 1940s, for instance, we had less than 10% of papers being written by more than one person. Um, in the 1990s, it was already almost half of papers being written by more than one author. And um, currently, we have around 75% of all papers being authored by more than one um, individual. And co-authorship has um, certain important functionalities um, for the academic careers. It um, certainly increases one's visibility within the research community. And um, research for multiple disciplines has shown that um, a large co-author network um, by which I mean the number of distinct individuals one um, writes uh, papers with, um, that the uh, network size uh, positively correlates with the higher number of citations, but also with a higher productivity. Uh, and at the same time, um, co-authoring with others uh, can help to lower certain risks, for instance, the risk for openly um, hostile criticism, and it also lowers the responsibility for errors that can occur in um, research, obviously. Um, at the same time, academic careers are not only built on uh, collaborative, but also on individual work. And this holds for mathematics as well as for other disciplines, um, presumably um, even more for humanities um, and philosophy, for instance. Um, single authorships have a different function um, than uh, collaborative papers. They rather serve as a proof of one's ability and credibility as a scientist. They show that um, one does not depend on senior people to develop ideas for guidance, um, to develop techniques, et cetera. So one is ready for a faculty position. Um, and this can uh, be particularly valuable at an early career stage since it sends a clear um, signal to the job market. At the same time, uh, it has some other uh, functions as well. It, uh, it reduces um, the necessity to make compromises. Um, there are no unclear responsibilities really and no communication issues something we call um, coordination costs in general. Um, and another important factor is that there is no unclear attribution. And by this, I mean that if a paper is written by multiple individuals, then the question arises, who was the driving force behind this research? And um, research in economics, so um, researchers who looked at uh, papers uh, and publication practices in, in economics have shown that um, the, um, th this issue of unclear attribution in multi-author papers affects women um, much more strongly than men. So another a good reason for uh, women to write um, papers alone. So um, coming to the question of uh, women in mathematics, we see that not only in mathematics, but in STEM fields in general, um, we see that a number of women who start um, publishing, so start a publishing research career in those fields is steadily growing. Um, but at the same time, they um, tend to have, for instance, shorter um, publishing careers and also lower chances of reaching um, tenured positions. So given, on the one hand, the importance of collaboration practices on academic career, and on the other hand, um, the, the issues that are uh, still present for women in um, academia, in particular in STEM fields, we wanted to investigate the following question, namely, what is actually the effect of gender on these two um, important collaboration um, indicators, namely the network size, so the number of different individuals we um, co-author with, and the number of single authorships. And there is some descriptive previous work that we have also conducted for mathematics, um, but it was um, it was not detailed enough. So we wanted um, this time to really uh, isolate, try to isolate and quantify um, the effect of gender. Um, so the, the way we approach this is by using data from ZBMath, which is an indexing and reviewing service for mathematics. And um, since ZBMath also indexes a lot of um, application uh, work, 
which is not really allocated, situated uh, mainly in mathematics, but more in other areas like biology or physics, um, we develop a heuristics to focus on so-called core mathematicians. Um, I'm happy to answer more details, um, to, to provide more details on this in the Q&A. Um, as you um, surely know, there is no um, information on author's gender uh, based on uh, author self-identification. When we publish papers, we do not um, write that down anyway, anywhere. So in order to conduct analyses like these ones, we are forced to um, infer gender from other attributes and we use names for that. There's a lot to criticize about this. Um, we have done that on our own and discussed that with uh, various people and also in publications. Um, but we do not really have a better approach right now to um, get information on gender um, in, in the context of publications. So we use certain um, statistical procedures and certain services to infer um, gender from names. Um, and of course, I'm also happy to um, answer questions um, with um, uh, regarding that in the Q&A. So um, we take this data and... Um, in this data, we have um, around uh, we have almost three million uh, publication records. They correspond to um, around two hundred sixty thousand unique authors. And after this um, gender prediction procedure, we have um, we end up with um, almost one hundred thirty thousand men and thirty five thousand uh, women, and the rest are individuals for whom we cannot um, do this prediction in a in a solid way. So. Um, what do we do with this data? We um, want to build uh, predictive models. Um, so we want to predict um, the network size and the number of single authorships from this data. And we want to see in those prediction models um, what role is played by the author's um, presumed gender. So what we do is um, we build a database um, in which for every author we list for every year the number of publications, uh, the seniority, and other attributes that we find um, relevant um, to build such a predictive model. So the subfield, um, um, information about the, the author's country or continent, um, the journals in which the person publishes, and so on. So we add a lot more information to this um, databases. And uh, also we have those target variables that are of particular interest to us. So this is the network size and the number of single authorships. So here, this example depicts an author uh, with an IDA, and that author has um, written two papers in 2015 and two uh, papers in 2018. In between, there was um, no published work, but we still list those years for this author. Um, and the only variable that changes in those years is the seniority, because the seniority is basically, you know, how long uh, is this person already publishing uh, research work in mathematics? So it starts with zero in the first year of publication, and um, it grows by one every year. And um, so this um, example author that we have here has written both, uh, author, uh, both publications in 2015 with the same person. So the network size is one and none of them was written alone, so the number of single authorships is zero. And in 2018, one of the two publications uh, was written alone, so here the, the number changes to one, and the other publication was written with four new individuals, so now we have a network size of five. Okay, so to give you an impression of how our data set is built, so we use this in order to build predictive models um, for these um, target variables using other attributes that we consider relevant. And also just to give you an idea how the variables correlate with each other, as you would expect, the network size positively correlates with the year. As I said, um, collaboration uh, has changed um, with the times, so from the 40s through the 90s um, to the nowadays. Um, it also positively correlates, obviously, with the seniority. The longer you are working in the field, the larger is your network. And, of course, it particularly um, correlates with the total number of publications. Um, and for single authorships, for instance, we see that it has a negative correlation with the year, but we do not really see a lot of effects from the other variable, at least on this level. 
And maybe just um, another uh, descriptive plot. So if we would um, look only at the distribution of the target variables with, res with respect to gender, then we would say we would see that um, women tend to have um, smaller networks and they also tend to publish less alone. So what you see here is a power law distribution of the network size and um, the proportion of women is in green, the proportion of men is in orange. So we have an excess of, um, of women in this group of smaller network sizes and slightly more men in all the other bars here and an even more pronounced trend for the number of single authorships. So if we wouldn't take into account any other aspects, uh, like seniority, for instance, then we would conclude that women actually have smaller networks and publish less alone. But what we want to do in this research is actually um, to quantify the effects of the other variables and to isolate the effect of gender. So the way we do this is, as I said, we build predictive models for each of these two target variables, taking um, other features into account that we consider relevant. And we try to build those models in comparative way. So here is a um, picture that looks a bit complicated, um, which shows you that we have two approaches um, to measure this. And I'm going to explain only one of them now. Um, but um, in fact, we get the same results with both approaches, which is great because it um, tells us that our results are robust. So what do we do? We start with the um, initial data set that we have here. So that's the records of uh, women and men in mathematics. And obviously, we have a lot more records by men. So what we do is we create a test set in which we have all data by women and the same amount of data by men, which is uh, sampled in a stratified way, meaning we try to keep um, the distributions, so we try to preserve the distributions of uh, important variables such, such as the total number of publications. So meaning that in this set, um, men do not uh, publish much more, for instance, in total than uh, women in the set. So we take the remaining male data. And what we do is here, we actually build a male model. So let's call it a male baseline model. So that means um, our prediction model, which tries to predict the network size and the number of single authorships, it um, gets only male data to build the model. Um, so there is no gender variable because it's only data for men. So we train the model and then we test it on these two um, sampled test data sets above. And then we evaluate um, how does the model perform on the male test set and how does it perform on the female test set. The model does not know anything about gender so because it has not seen that variable in the training time. So in test time, it doesn't also know um, anything about gender. So it does, it's not aware of that um, variable at all. Um, but we know about it, so we can evaluate um, how the model performs on um, the male and the female test set. So I'll give you a summary of what we have found out, and then I'll show you a picture. Um, so it turns out using those models, so the models are good enough. So they are they are solid models. They um, they are um, they manage to learn actually the patterns in the data and to predict the network size and the number of single authorships in a way that is good enough. Um, for what we um, try to do here. Um, so we can actually utilize those models. And it turns out that women, in fact, have slightly larger networks than men if we control for um, the other relevant variables. Um, and women, um, at the same time, they do have a fewer number of um, single authorships than men, but the difference is not as large as um, was suggested by previous um, descriptive analyses. So it's around 4.5% less. Um, so basically what we see is, okay, so they actually have like uh, even slightly larger networks. Um, the difference in terms of single authorships is not that pronounced. So there is in, in summary, a little difference between female and male mathematicians when um, we look at um, this, this uh, collaboration variables and when we take into account other variables that people would of course also assess um, when individuals apply for a job for a grant or whatever so we would conclude that these differences alone presumably contribute very little to the explanation of the existing gender gap in mathematics so for us this means okay we can tick the box it's not really collaboration at least not on this level so um 
We will, um, in future work, presumably look more into the way of collaboration. So maybe there is a difference in who with uh, of a difference in who we are collaborating with. Is it more senior people? Is it more influential people, and so on? Um, but also turn to more um, turn to other metrics and not look that much um, more into collaboration. Um, and to give you an impression of how uh, what results we get from this modeling approach. So here, the left hand column in green is data is the, the green test data for a women. So this is our women test set. And the orange data is a visualization of um, the model's performance on the male test set. So recall that these two test sets have very similar distributions in terms of um, the number of the total number of publications and a similar distribution in terms of seniority. So um, and what you see is the solid lines are the actual data in our test set. So the actual network size in, in the case of this graph and um, the dotted lines are what the model has predicted. So you see here that the model and so the, the um, in the in the male test set, you see that uh, basically the, the mean, so the average prediction of the model and the um, average actual data overlap pretty much perfectly, um, which means that on average, the model um, works really well on male data, which confirms that the model works. Uh, and of course, it works well on male data because it has been fully trained on male data. So but what does it do with female data? So with female data, so with data from with publications from women, it actually underestimates um, their network sizes. So um, it does that only slightly, so which is why we only see a slight difference in um, network sizes. But you see that the dotted lines are slightly below the solid lines. Um, and in particular, in those areas of increased seniorities and in the last decades. So um, that means that um, if those individuals in the female test set, um, if so basically like um, the model judges only on attributes like the total number of publications, the seniority, the subfield, um, type of journals or journals presumed quality, continent, and so on. And the model has learned from male data. So if there was nothing related to gender, then we would also have a full overlap in the green data. But we don't have it. So that means that the model underestimates the networking um, of women, which means that in reality, there is some very small gender effect um, and we would say that women have um, a stronger or larger, slightly larger networks than men. And we get similar pictures for the other uh, methodological approach and um, similar pictures for single authorships. But basically there, the model overestimates um, the number of single authorships and the difference is um, larger. Right, so I'm happy to provide more details in the Q&A. My time is um, certainly over. Thank you very much. And here's the reference in case you would like to um, check some more details afterwards. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let me see if, uh, uh, oh, okay. Uh, Helena is online. So uh, uh, any questions uh, from our audience here? Yeah, uh, she's uh, mute. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. So, uh, any questions from uh, our uh, audience? If not, maybe. Oh, okay. I was about um, to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for this talk. Uh, I understand the study is about. Louder. 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 I understand. Sorry, yeah, they cannot hear me at the back of the room. <laughs> I understand the study is about co-authorship. Uh, have you at all considered the order in which the articles were signed? Because uh, I think in most scientific disciplines, a break in the alphabetical order is meaningful. Or I don't know whether your model, uh, you would need to build a further model for that. Um, we didn't do that because um, at least a what we did before already, I think like uh, two years ago, we checked for the ordering in mathematics papers and it's still pretty much alphabetical. So in contrast to pretty much, I think, every other discipline, uh, mathematics, uh, 
at least still um, uses alphabetical ordering. It might have changed in the last two, three years. Uh, I haven't checked for that, but um, at least until a couple of years ago, it was basically alphabetical. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, uh, particip participants asked their information about your research. So maybe if you have the link to your um, article, maybe you could put that in the uh, chat box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I can definitely do it on slides okay. on the last slide, but I'll definitely add it. Yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, Ilian, yeah. yeah. I was wanting to ask her so the 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 uh, Jillian's question is whether you can uh, discern a difference between uh, the gender of people involved in the net respective networks of men and women. Yes, we didn't do that. That would be the next thing that we would uh, look at, uh, seniority and gender of collaborators and maybe some other aspects like internationality of collaboration. But we wanted to see first on this uh, on this top level distinction, do we actually see uh, real effects if we take into account different methodological approaches and a bunch of variables that we can actually um, that you would actually or that we actually know contribute to both of these um, both of these measures and so basically, like for us, um, so in terms of the network size, so there was actually descriptive results uh, for mathematics and some other disciplines that suggest that women collaborate less, so with less different people. But what we see is it's not true. So in mathematics, it's least, at least it's not true. Um, so there is basically no difference. And if you, if you would look at it in terms of effect size, I would say there is basically no effect. There is no gender effect in terms of like network size. And there is like a very, very small difference um, in terms of like the percentage of um, single authorships. And that would also be interesting to see in what stage it actually happens, because I, I I would believe, or at least this is what literature suggests, that the set in, in, in terms of like assessing academic performance, this is particularly relevant at an early career stage, not so relevant uh, later on. So um, that would be another detail to look at. So um, I hope that we can do a follow-up study and, and check exactly those aspects as well. Yeah, um, Mary Francoise. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you seem to, to conclude that maybe uh, what you observe does not play such a role in the gender gap in mathematics. But I believe, in fact, that uh, often when uh, publications are evaluated, if it's a co author of publication, people tend spontaneously to think that the, uh, that the, uh, the um, contribution of women is less. It's less important that they are kind of following some leader. And uh, so it's kind of evaluated as bad for them to be collaborating. When well, for a man to be able to attract collaborators is extremely good. So I think, in fact, the fact that there are many collaborations for women can really play a role in their evaluation when they, you know, when they apply for positions. <coughs> so, so you should repeat. Did, did you hear Marie-Francoise clearly? Um, half, if I understand it correctly, it's about the effect or the impact of having an, having a publication alone versus collaborating with others and who it's attributed to if you collaborate with others. Or did I misunderstand it? Yes, yes. Uh, Marie-Françoise was talking especially about assessment, that collaboration is sex, assessed positively for a man because yeah. he can attract collaborations and negatively for a woman. But that's something I know of from economics because there is really solid research about that where they can actually show that when women collaborate in economics, then typically the, the work is not attributed to them but uh, mainly to their male collaborators. So they are actually at a, at a disadvantage when collaborating in terms of attribution. Um, but I'm not aware of uh, systematic studies for other disciplines. So that would be really interesting to see. Um, it exists for economics, but it's, it's not really easy to generalize from one field to another one um, because we really see like in terms of those bibliometric um, effects, we see differences between disciplines. So I don't know how it looks like in mathematics, um, but it would be really interesting to find out whether those, um, um, at least like um, 
how to say, like what Marie Francoise was just um, talking about and her own experiences, whether that actually generalizes um, for the discipline um, or not. But I, I'm not aware of any research for mathematics in those terms. Yeah, okay. Um, Helena, I have a quick question about the seniority because you talk about the seniority of the authors and how did you decide? Um, right. Oh, yeah, we, we make it really simple. We just basically we basically look for how long we see the, the person in our data. So uh, we do not model it in terms of categories like PhD, postdoc and so on. We're basically looking at like for how long are they actually publishing because we are kind of thinking it's basically a matter of time until you uh, until you get in touch with others and actually get the possibility to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think the time is up and uh, thank you very much you. for your uh, work and the uh, presentation. Uh, that was very inspiring and uh, we hope to read more of your publications in the future. Thank you. So, yeah. um, thank you very much. I a really nice day and uh, have a good time. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, that's the end of our webinar. And thank you to all the presenters for the wonderful uh, and inspiring uh, presentations. And I think that's a, a quite a meaning uh, for this special day. And we hope every, everybody will learn a lot from here and looking for uh, further cooperations. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.